brain echo. So we just wanted to give you some idea about some of the things, observations we're making on patients and why and how, and uh, sort of walk you through that. Uh, any point that anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt. And so we were going to start with a little short vignette. We have three little cases to show today, uh, and they're kind of interesting. Uh, but the first one is just a short vignette of a lady who's a 60-year-old female with a history of stage 2A left breast invasive ductile carcinoma. She's T1, N1, MO, PR negative, HER2 positive, ER positive. That is both left breast lumpectomy. She had some sentinel load lymph node biopsies, two out of five positive lymph nodes. Chemotherapy with six cycles of taxotere, carboplatinin. Herceptin, May 27th, September 27th, continuing on Herceptin, and radiotherapy with a custom design contour radiotherapy based on CT. 30 sessions for six weeks, left breast. 26 sessions with six positions, four to the breast only. Last dose in December 2015, who was under surveillance evaluation with us with uh, transthoracic echo, strain echo. Uh, 4D echo, troponin, and BNP. And so basically uh, this was the computer contourized CT application with uh, these ISO lines to uh, determine the uh, location and amount of radiation uh, going from a central point of the tumor, breast, lymph node structures, uh, looks, looks like mostly node structures here, uh, basically, and showing where the heart is located and uh, what's happening in terms of cardiac possible radiation. And so this is uh, the ISO. Do, do they do that with a breath hold? Yes, breath hold is uh, very helpful and uh, getting the heart out of the way. And so hopefully the therapy is also done with, a long, with long breath holds as a patient can respond. <coughs> this is just some idea of what we were looking at in terms of strain echo. Strain echo is basically has been standardized somewhat uh, by General Electric, which apparently has had the longest experience in terms of research uh, and basically our tech, oh, our tech went to somebody, uh, please mute, you, mute yourself if you, you have background noise otherwise we'll have to establish who it is and mute them uh, so we got somebody laughing, and we'll have to figure out how to mute it. Uh, so moving on here, uh, the uh, strain echo has been standardized. Uh, Doctor, the group at MD Anderson has had some uh, quite a bit of experience, and then Cleveland Clinic, and then Doctor Marwick, who moved from Cleveland Clinic to Tasmania, and uh, our tech went and trained with Doctor Bunches. Uh, Jose Baches, who's at MD Anderson now, and uh, then uh, we had some training from Dr. Marwick, and so trying to perfect our technique, trying to make sure that we avoid uh, papillar muscle, we have a standardization in our technique, uh, we have adequate images to be able to come up with uh, strain echo averaging on global longitudinal strain, which is seems to be uh, the most accurate uh, in echocardiography. And so you can see we were monitoring these patients, uh, this patient with troponin, BNP, ejection fraction over this period of time of chemotherapy which ceased in September and then picked up for the radiotherapy and then the radiotherapy ceased uh, and in uh, late December. And so these uh, are the images that we have. So we can say that you know, we're pretty good at what we're doing. Not many people are good at strain, and so we've had a lot of practice. We're doing strain now on every echo we do just for practice, and so that's a lot of patients. 
And so, so I think uh, what we've done here uh, is representative uh, because uh, the patient uh, had good echocardiograms that you can see the reproductibility of the ejection fraction uh, is a good uh, standard to show you uh, exactly uh, how accurate we are in what we're doing. And then you can see the BNP never crossed the threshold of importance, which according to Linehan at all is 250. And we see the troponin research by Dr. Cardinale really hasn't made any change at all. This is not a highly significant or highly sensitive troponin. Uh, this is just the standard USA troponin that we've been using for a long time. And then you can see that looking at the strain, uh, you can see that there were some abnormalities that sort of generated over time. And we're very interested in the average strain. And our average strain went from minus 17.8 to minus 18, looks like minus 18 or so, to minus 13. And so the global longitudinal strain did have a drop during this period of time going over uh, during this period of time when the patient received chemotherapy as well as radiation. What this represents, I'm not sure, because I haven't had a lot of experience looking at patients who've had irradiation uh, and uh, looking at them pretty closely afterwards. Uh, we don't have a CT scan on this patient as baseline, which we get on all ladies over 50, all males over 40. Uh, and because uh, they were having some difficulty starting an IV on her and she got disgusted and left. Uh, and uh, we don't have an MRI to look at strain for correlation and to look at T2W for edema or T1 for edema. And so uh, I would suggest that there's an, um, edema, some edema in this heart. And I would suggest these changes will revert quite rapidly back to normal. It'll be interesting to see. I'm just throwing this out as to tell you and show you how much we don't know about strain and how much we probably don't know about strain and radiation therapy on top of some chemotherapy. So this is just food for thought. Uh, we don't have a lot of information and uh, this is kind of a preliminary show of uh, what we've been doing with strain and what we don't know about it. Any questions about this? Yeah, it's interesting that it's all in the sort of anterior lateral area. Uh, you know, at least the the change in strain, uh, which which is the radiation exposure area, correct? I assume so. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think anybody's done anything on strain and radiation to see the immediate effects of radiation. I'm wondering if there's some edema, and uh, if this is a short-lasting thing. I think you need to know about it if you're tracking chemotherapy, and all of a sudden radiation comes into play, and we get this temporary radiation exposure change of some edema, but no troponin, no BNP. So it's yeah, interesting. I'm, we will have to find out more. Sorry I don't have more information to tell you. Sorry we don't have Dr. Marwick here. He's probably the master of strain. But uh, we'll certainly talk to him about this next time I see him. So let's move on to uh, the meat of meaty cases. This is just a lightweight, you know, sort of provocative uh, <laughs> discussion. And so let's talk about coronary CTA, post-chest radiation, cancer patients, uh, and see what you all think about this. And basically, case one is a very nice gentleman who we've become great friends over the years. He's 67 years old and is involved in several charities here in town. And he uh, was seen here first in September. And uh, he, before that, he'd experienced after a very heavy meal at lunchtime, including wine, a lot of fatty foods, he wasn't hungry for dinner and woke up at like 2 in the morning with a lot of eructation and went to the emergency room at Tampa General and had the usual workup, uh, basically, which is uh, usually you have a troponin, you get echo, uh, chest x-ray, and uh, spec scan and uh, frequently spec and cath, this time just spec and spec was normal with uh, chemo uh, pharmaceutical type uh, stress, I think it was Lexiscan 
And so he said, hey, you've had a bad episode of GERD. See ya. Have a good day. Follow up with the cardiologist. I, I guess I, I would think they say follow up with the gastroenterologist, but they said follow up with the cardiologist. I'm glad they said that because um, he came over to see me and basically we looked at his history. It's very complicated. Uh, he has a hypertension, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma years ago, got radiation for that, had some radiation to the spine area as well, uh, lumbar spine lymphoma, as you see here. And uh, he also had developed into later, segued into chronic lymphocytic leukemia, followed at the NIH where he has some connections and a family history of some coronary artery disease, uh, non-smoker, and uh, doesn't exercise. His weight's like 209 and uh, takes all this stuff as well as adriamycin exposure uh, when he had his lymphoma maybe 12, 13 years ago. And the physical exam was fine. And uh, here's his EKG. Dan, if you'd like to remark on his EKG, appreciate it. Uh, it has a left axis deviation, a uh, little bit of poor R wave progression. Um, those would be the main findings, sinus rhythm, no, no okay. clear infarction. Yeah, and unfortunately we don't, we don't display the numbers on this, and I think the QRS is a little bit wide, I'm not sure, maybe a little incomplete, you know, IVCD or something, I don't know, it's a little bit wide. So we don't have the numbers on here, and so next uh, we'll talk about his echocardiogram looked fine, of course he had it at Tampa General, he had some moderate regurgitation, and so Hey, here's a guy who got a lot of radiation. He does have a bicuspid aortic valve. I can't tell you if the moderate regurgitation is from the bicuspid. Probably is. Maybe the radiation contributed. Who knows? It's a mild MR and TR. RV systolic pressure 37. No LVH from his longstanding hypertension. Normal carotid hemodynamics, but some non calcified carotid plaques. We always look at that. Uh, sometimes there's correlation with the coronary, sometimes not. But we always take a look at it. Seeing a lot of ladies in their early 40s with some carotid non-calcified plaque seem to be uh, very common nowadays, maybe 30 percent or so. And then uh, CTA, we're going to show you our CTA. The overread of the CTA was for some, some lip nodes, that's all being followed to NIH, and uh, some possible bronchiectasis right medial lung base. And so let me uh, get up our CT. You may see some names. We, we're holding you responsible by HIPAA to uh, not uh, reveal uh, identification. We do anonymization usually, and uh, sometimes that fails on this program. So if you see names, just uh, blot them out. Mark, while you're loading the images, uh, uh, virtually everybody who has some mediastinal radiation has some fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis, and they almost all have traction bronchiectasis uh, when you get uh, CT scans. Uh, thank you. And so... Uh, what do you mean by traction bronchiectasis? What happens is the, with the fibrosis, uh, the, the, the bronchioles get stretched and uh, the, at the end they dilate and uh, it turns into bronchiectasis. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're presenting you with our CT scan, uh, and you can see on the right-hand side, uh, we're looking at the main left coronary uh, where it's dividing into the LAD that's going to the right, uh, our, our, your right, the anatomical left, I guess, and uh, the uh, circumflex, which is going to your left, and you can see uh, that the main left is not uh, the same size as the LAD plus the circumflex, which it should be, but is actually uh, smaller uh, and is about the size of maybe the circumflex. And uh, so there's a significant main left narrowing uh, at least 50 percent, and actually it becomes a little bit more down uh, at uh, the bifurcation. And you can see at the orange of the circumflex, there's a big old plaque there. That, that is not beam hardening. That is actually non-calcified plaque along here. It's fibrosis, 
and uh, there's a calcified plaque, and then uh, there's some more stuff down here as we move down further. There's a uh, looks like some narrowing there that we'll dwell on in a minute. And then as we go down the LED, there's some proximal LED, distal main left, non-calcified plaque, and then a couple of calcified plaques as we move along here. So uh, this is very interesting. We'll see what uh, we can make out of this a little bit more. Wow, uh, that image right there is kind of impressive. Yeah, it's very, very yeah. interesting uh, plaque. and. It's uh, sort of like the whole the whole vessel is diseased. Yeah, the, the whole the whole first is. third. Yeah. Yeah. Now we look at over here. We can look at the main left, and we can also look at the right. And uh, you can see the right over here, and the right's really hypoplastic. So that tells us that the circumflex is a dominant circumflex. I'm getting rid of some of this trash here, and uh, to get out of our view. And uh, basically, we have a dominant circumflex circulation, dominant left, very small hypoplastic right over here that uh, is of little consequence because of its hypoplastic size. And then we can actually give you better information as we come over here and get an axial image. And with the axial image, we can take off the vessel view and uh, come over here and look at uh, this valve. You know, I don't know if that's bicuspid or not. Maybe from the echo they thought it was. You know, but there we are. We can actually triangulate that, and you can get a better idea about that valve. I suspect that's a tricuspid valve that got some radiation. Yeah. So, it's got uh, thick so there we go. There. Yeah. So there we are. Let's go back over here to where we were looking. And we can see, I always look to see if there's LVH, and uh, we can look at the papillary muscle and the alignment, the mitral valve. We can see the, the aortic valve. We can see the calcification of the right. And the right is, has some more distal calcification, and the right just sort of peters out real fast. And then we can see the uh, origin of the main left. We can see the trifurcation, and we can see some complex disease in there in, uh, in that trifurcation. So the, the spec scan showed no major abnormalities? Uh, that is true. And uh, the, uh, if you were a spectographer, you would say, oh, well, you know, it's main left disease. And so it's going to be the whole ventricle is going to have decreased counts. And so you won't be able to find a relative difference uh, because the right hypoplastic and not important. And so they would try to explain away uh, the fact that it's normal. Of course. You and I know uh, that's a according to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, 47 heart centers, that there's a 40% false positive, 65% false negative in the real world of spec scanning, not Dan Berman, uh, not uh, Hans Wackers or uh, Franz Wackers or any of the other guys, uh, Bill Strauss, but in the real world, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fail. And so we can talk about that some other time, but uh, it's definitely a fail in my book. I want to show you a little bit more about this man's study. And so hang on here, and we'll go get some special images that we have that we can look at uh, and restore them. Takes a second for the restoration. And so I, uh, so here's the main left, and you can see the disease, and here's the this uh, very interesting plaque uh, right near the bifurcation. And then we get down here, and this is the plaque of interest for me. And so I'm looking is, the, is the circumflex basically subtotally occluded? or No, it's not really subtotally occluded. And we can give you numbers on this. That's not really subtotally occluded there. And uh, the plaque of interest, the main plaque of interest for me is uh, this one here which is actually in the uh, circumflex more distal to the bifurcation. And uh, that one is where we're looking over here, and you can see what we've been calling the, for the student, medical students the fried green egg with ketchup. And so what we see is the lumen, uh, which is the green uh, marking contrast, increased density. And then we see that there's remodeling that's positive by the expansion of this area. Uh, uh, inside the little brown line, 
and then you see the red, and the red stuff is really necrotic core. That's uh, less than 50 milli, uh, 50 uh, Hounsfield units, and uh, and you see that the it's it's not very close to the lumen, except down here it's getting closer to the lumen. Well, we can't tell you about uh, thin fibrous cap because that's talking about 65 to 85 uh, micrometers, and so we can't measure anything like that. You can't even measure that with IVIS. And so, uh, basically, I was concerned about this plaque because of the characteristics that it has. And so, we can look at some of those characteristics and see what the uh, cross-sectional area is of necrotic core. And we've got like 28% there at the uh, plaque uh, where it's at its narrowest uh, lumen. And then we come over here and the whole plaque, if we call this the start of the plaque and at the end of the plaque, the whole plaque has 27.6% volume necrotic core. And so uh, for me, that's a worrisome plaque. And so I'm always looking for plaques of interest. Now, we don't want to miss the forest for an individual tree. And so the forest is, yes, this guy has some significant main left disease, proximate circumflex disease, proximal LED disease, hypoplastic uh, right, and uh, and then this plaque that I call a plaque of interest. And so we did move on in our discussions with this gentleman. Then we see that in this area it's 46% diameter, 74% uh, cross-sectional area stenosis. Let me go on to uh, more imaging uh, and back to our slide deck. So hang on. So we do, we do have uh, sort of a uh, three test uh, look at patients that have plaque that appears to be vulnerable. And one of our tests is the pulse test, which is a um, proteins that are seven protein markers for our inflammation that are very exotic proteins, uh, including uh, hepatic growth factor, uh, we got CTAC, eotaxin, MCAP, uh, there's interleukin 16. FAS and SFAS and FAS ligand. And uh, these are all been correlated with uh, one, a database at the Marshfield Clinic, and then a database uh, at the NIH, which is the multi ethnic group. And so uh, he came out in his testing to be 6.44 times higher risk for a male 67 years old. And so for me, that's a, that's a pretty high risk of having a cardiac event in the next five years. And so uh, here's, again, looking at our plaque, trying to get involved in plaque characterization, which we do quite a bit of nowadays. And uh, this is uh, getting very specific about the plaque, as we were just a minute ago. And uh, this is actually taking the plaque and uh, looking at the contrast as it's going through the plaque and uh, taking that and dissecting it out and getting a convergent, divergent double cone which is applicable to uh, the computational fluid dynamics and certainly is great for illustrating the Bernoulli principle uh, as the blood flow velocity increases, the pressure drops, and the drop of the pressure is right over the top of this necrotic core plaque. And so the pressure is least uh, on that area. On the proximal shoulder, the pressure is greatest. and then. As it comes out the other side, these eddies and vortices develop, uh, which put further pressure uh, and uh, further uh, activity on uh, the distal shoulder of the plaque. And so this, we think that that's a hemodynamically unfavorable circumstance that comes up when you have a convergent, divergent double cone, which is uh, what we used to use for rocket nozzles and probably still do. And so uh, this was the FFR that uh, we got uh, on this particular patient uh, from Charles Taylor and uh, his group at HeartFlow. And you can see there's significant uh, reduction, less than 0 0.80, uh, less than 0 0.75 is significant. And so we can see uh, the right coronary artery, which doesn't mean anything, is 0 0.82. So it's got normal flow, but it's hypoplastic. And then we got the LED with a 0.69. And uh, then we got uh, 0.61 in the circumflex. Uh, and so uh, basically, we put this together, and we call this a triple positive. And so uh, sort of mimicking uh, what's done with breast cancer 
we decided triple positive sounds like a pretty interesting thing to use, and so we've got uh, basically the plaque looking at a positive, and we've got uh, our markers, which is a positive, and then we've got our flow, which is a positive. So we think this is a good prediction for a cardiac event in the future at this uh, plaque site, uh, regardless of what's going on in the main left or the circumflex origin. And so, so the immediate therapy was uh, one to avoid fatty foods, aspirin, Lipitor, and we talked to him about bypass surgery. He said no. We talked to him about oh angioplasty stenting. He said no, and he wasn't interested. He was asymptomatic and doing fine. He had he was told he had one episode of GERD. He was told his heart was normal at Tampa General with his spec skin, and so he didn't want to go any further. His weight was 209. It looked like he could do a lot of things to change. And so we said, okay, uh, let's see what we can do about changing your lifestyle and habits. Any questions uh, at this point? So he didn't uh, he didn't buy the statistics of 550,000 sudden deaths in the United States each year. Yeah, he wasn't uh, he wasn't interested in that. But as we go on, uh, we'll see more about what his how his opinion changed, and so. <laughs> Uh, he uh, saw a pulmonologist for his abnormal CT scans, had some bronchodilator responsive obstructive uh, ventilatory defect, compatible with asthma, was put on Delera, Pro-Air, patient underwent uh, check uh, for sleep apnea and had mild sleep apnea. Seen in my office in follow-up and I saw him uh, April the 1st, the, first, the entry uh, was back in September and I saw him April 1st and he was not tolerating the Lipitor before statin myopathy. He was doing fine, asymptomatic still, and exercising. He claimed he was doing a lot, you know, with spin classes and a bunch of stuff, but his weight in September was 209, and his weight April 1st was 209. So I, I'm very doubtful about uh, any lifestyle changes that were taking place in this gentleman. Um, and so let me show you. Uh, but he didn't. He didn't gain weight, so maybe he did have lifestyle changes. Yeah, may, maybe so. Maybe so. And so, true to Dr. Linehan's uh, proposition that if you have a vulnerable plaque, you may not have symptoms, but you're at risk of having a cardiac event. And my feeling is, if you have vulnerable plaque plus positive markers plus uh, positive FFR, you're at great risk of having a cardiac event. Apparently, especially if there's a lot of necrotic core in that plaque, and so, so uh, the uh, truth came out, and uh, the future was uh, foretold by Dr. Lenihan, and this patient uh, did present, uh, luckily not with sudden death, but with four hours of substernal chest pain, and he's on the phone calling his friends. He's out of town. He's calling his friends, trying to find out what to do, uh, as if you know he didn't know anything from what we told him. Uh, and denial can be pretty strong uh, influence, and so he's in trouble. And uh, Dan, you want to take another look at his EKG when he's in trouble? Yeah, well, yes. Uh, his QRS does appear to be a little bit wider now. Uh, still has his left axis deviation. It's got hyperacute T waves in V3 and 4 with some ST depressions. Uh, B2 mainly and one in ABL. I would be very worried about multi coronary distribution ischemia on this on this EKG. This is his uh, cardiac cath, and so you see that the, this is called the parrot beak, uh, and we have a video too we can show you. So we're going to switch to the video now, but you can see where his uh, occlusion is. Well, you know, I mean, the coronary CT that you that you showed was really quite impressive, and the fact that he had such complex circumflex disease, you know, it, you know, suggests that maybe this would be electrically silent, uh, you know, at least when he presents with an acute acute problem. <clears throat> so, anyway. Let's uh, let's roll through this and see what's going on with this guy. Why in the world did they put a wire down the right? I have no earthly idea. There was some collateralization from the right to perforators, and that was about it. And so here here is the 
culprit lesion, which is being penetrated with a wire, and uh, now we're opening up the circumflex. The guy's in big trouble. He's under epinephrine drip. There's the main left lesion. There's uh, the proximal circumflex lesion. But it's interesting that uh, the occlusion is exactly at the vulnerable plaque site uh, that we had demonstrated, not at the other areas. And so uh, we're getting the circ open, and uh, he's on a balloon pump, and uh, he's in he's in big trouble, and uh, almost sudden death is his presentation. And now uh, we're open. We've got a pacer wire into. So reconstitution of that artery that's been very successful with uh, lots of residual disease. Hang on, and we'll change back. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, okay, that's a good result for 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 that day. Uh, but you know, I wouldn't be real happy about the way that left main looks. So exactly, and so we put a band-aid on uh, on a lesion here, and uh, he's got severe problems. So he comes back, lucky to be alive, uh, gets into a cardiac rehab program, and uh, this was the findings, of course, that we discussed before with a hypoplastic uh, right and uh, catheterization, bradycardia, epinephrine, aspiration, thrombectomy. PEE, ventricular fibrillation, cardiovascular, all the stuff that took place, interaortic <laughs> balloon pump, and ICU, and 35% ejection fraction, all kinds of stuff going on in this guy. It was horrible. And finally goes home, defibrillator vest, vest comes back to Tampa, no symptoms, and ejection fraction 57%. And oh my goodness, what a lucky guy this is. Hey, he should go to the racetrack. So follow up, we got an MRI on him we'd like to show you. So it looks pretty good. His mitral valve looks pretty competent. There's his by cut there's his by cut his uh, tricuspid aortic valve. You can see a little bit of aortic regurgitation. His ventricle looks pretty good, surprisingly, uh, after all he's been through. Even the right ventricle looks good. There you can see his aortic regurgitation a little better. We th I consider the MRI as accurate in terms of characterizing regurgitation as TEE, certainly visually and then numerically, you know, it's very, very good because of the numbers we can come up with phase imaging. And so he did do some phase imaging, and this is probably uh, somewhere in there. Is the, there we go, is the phase. Uh, where we do uh, equivalent to what you see from Doppler. It's very bright. Hang on here. There we go. And so uh, so we can actually take uh, the anatomy and we can put this phase on the anatomy and, uh, and come up with uh, calculations on how much aortic regurgitation he had, uh, which is not severe. And uh, you can see his wall and basically uh, He's got some, still had some edema, or some probably uh, some persistent edema. But uh, in terms of looking for late gadolinium enhancement, uh, this is a LG image for that, and uh, we can look. Whoa, hang on here. We can look for LGE. We we did have a little edema though, and hang on here, and we'll see if we can get the proper image with the look locker. And here it is. And so there's no real brightness on the lateral wall. So a little bit in the septum there. I don't know why. That must be the, uh, I don't think that's uh, abnormal in the septum. And so, but you can look and see that we've got nice darkness here on that image. And uh, no late. LGE. So then let's go on and uh, we'll show you some more stuff about this very interesting gentleman. And so 
we had uh, a little bit of, uh, I think, just a little edema there and uh, lateral wall on the T2W, viable myocardium, no leg adenoma enhancement, ejection fraction still consistent, 56%. Some ischemia, basically, that we could demonstrate it with Lexascan. And we repeated his CT images, and we're trying to talk him into going to surgery. And here's uh, the stent that he got. Here's a uh, this very complex plaque in here that's the same, and here's the severe main left disease and uh, the LED disease. And uh, how many millimeters is that left ostea left main? How, yeah, how wide is that? Uh, do we have the CT here on this one? Let me get it. I'll tell you. The stent's probably four millimeters, so that would be a two millimeter ostium. That's not very much. Putting a snapshot up, waiting for it. And oh, here we go. So this is going to give us what you need. So let's put a ruler over here, and uh, we can come across like this, and we can measure this. There you go. And then we can. Uh, also, get rid of and that. I, you know, the whole artery is, in, you know, basically it's either involuted, like it's you know gotten smaller from his radiation, or yeah, he's got uh, you know diffuse, you know, sort of con concentric disease. But yeah, I would say that's a highly significant left main, and he he should have surgery while he's still alive. I mean that right there, the ostium is tiny. These are really amazing images. Let's go on and show you some more here. So how has your conversation gone with this patient? He is now in cardiac rehab and uh, for the first time gets a symptom, thank goodness. He is having jaw pain during exercise in rehab, had his first episode and I said, come down to the office. So he came down to the office. We went through this very carefully. We got Henry Lieberman on the phone from uh, Emory. We discussed that with Henry. And uh, we said Mr. Uh, H was going to go catch a plane today to Emory and would be in your clinic today for consideration of surgery. So let's talk about what are we going to consider in this guy. Uh, Dan, you got some ideas about what we're going to do? Uh, well, I would have probably liked to have seen his IMA graph or his, his takeoff of his internal mammary, but I would have sent him or I would send him for uh, Lima and uh, maybe an SVG. Yeah, so we're concerned about the radiation therapy he's had and how things are going to be socked in. Even the lima we're concerned about. Certainly concerned about the right ventricle adhering to the sternum and all the complications you get from large mantle radiation exposure in somebody with mediastinal exposure. And also, he had this exposure to the back because of the spinal lymphoma. And so uh, we're proposing. Uh, and we picked out Henry Lieberman because of his articles about hybrid surgery. So we're, we're, we're thinking that busting in there is not going to go well. And we're thinking if we could get somebody to hook something up, you know, to uh, the left hand tier descending from the Lima, if it's good. And so we don't want to hook up here. Actually, what we want to do is we want to harvest this robotically. Uh, and we want to hook it up distally. And then we want to stage this and then go back in and put stents in the main left, a circumflex, and LAD. And so that's basically our proposal was to do this procedure. And that's exactly what we did do. Uh, and uh, he tolerated pretty good. Had some uh, 
other problems, but he tolerated all that good. And he's doing very well today, two years later, and uh, and it's a sterling guy. He's, he's lost 30 pounds. He got religion, and uh, he's adhering to everything that we never got his attention about before. And so that's uh, we have another quick case to follow up, and then we can have some discussion about the radiation and about the application of cardiac CT, and so uh, and uh, basically advanced cardiac imaging. So here's a 54-year-old lady who's a nursing assistant who uh, was first seen back in November 2013 had a right bundle branch block in her EKG. That's why she was sent over here. Denied any symptoms or anything. Has a history of left breast radiation three years ago. You know, not much follow-up time, left breast lumpectomy, right breast reduction. She was a smoker, so she's got some risk factors. Father had heart disease, more risk factors. She has hypertension, more risk factors. So we got a bunch of risk factors in a lady who got some radiation to her left breast. was modern technique. And so physical examination is normal. And her EKG, Dan. Mm. She's got a incomplete right bundle. Sinus rhythm, uh, left axis deviation, also uh, a little bit of T wave change in the anterior, probably due to the right bundle. Uh, that's about it. Okay, and she had an echo with 80% ejection fraction, normal contractility, some LVH from her hypertension. Valves look pretty good. Everybody's got some carotid stuff with normal hemodynamics, and so we're not going to go into the question next, but we're going to show you her CT images. Hang on. CT images, uh, we want to know what her coronaries are like, uh, just because she's come to our clinic, she's had some radiation, and we basically are interested in that, and ladies over 50, uh, and a gentleman over 40, and so basically looking at her CT, uh, looking at the left anterior descending, which uh, is in very big vessels, she's got uh, area of calcification that, uh, in the left anterior descending, uh, right before it bifurcates into this big diagonal vessel, and uh, we can show you more about that uh, in terms of black morphology, uh, and you can see that she does have uh, good blood flow on the other side of that, in that uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it's not even 50% uh, of this vessel. There's this blooming artifact. I'm sure the piece of calcium is much smaller than that. It's probably just a streak on the wall, but we get all this blooming artifact, uh, which is uh, causes that to be bigger than it really is. And you can see there's no attenuation uh, in terms of the contrast distally. We're getting some good contrast density. So I suspect that uh, this is just a incidental finding and doesn't have any significance. And so you would probably conclude then that the, the CT really wasn't of any value, but let's wait and see. So we'll take us back to the slides. I had an episode of chest pain of some sort back in November when lying down, lasted a few minutes. It was kind of atypical for her. Maybe it was GERD, who knows. And she comes in for a routine follow-up. Uh, and uh, she's been, she ran out of her medications for two or three weeks, and here she is with asymptomatic and uh, physical exam doesn't really show anything and uh, back to her EKG again. Except for her hypertension that she had. Exactly. Uh, EKG says uh, major axis change. She's now got a right axis deviation. Uh, big time anterior T wave changes. Uh, yeah, I would, you know, first I would make sure her mental status was okay, but then if her mental status was okay, I would, I would say she's got a big LED problem. Uh, so, yeah, mental status is fine, uh, asymptomatic. We're loading these images on the echocardiogram, and so let's get some motion here on the echo. It's actually probably be better if we just flip over to uh, an apical four chamber view. And so here's our apical four chamber view. And uh, here's our wall motion. 
and uh, not sure if I can speed this up or not. No. But that's what you see is the base is beating well. Uh, Dan, any comments here? Yeah, I mean that's a mid LED apex area is all akinetic. So let's recall that her LED on her coronary CTA did not go to the apex, did not go to the apex. It ran down the interventricular septum and then just sort of petered out about two-thirds of the way down. So it still could be a stress cardiomyopathy. And yep. so, so there, basically, this LAD would supply up to this area here and would not supply all the way around this area, okay? So this is beyond the distribution of this left tear descending as we know it in this patient. So basically, exactly right. We're dealing with the Takata Supo that's asymptomatic. We just discovered this on this patient's follow-up visit. She has an asymptomatic taco to subo. Mm -hmm. well, there, there are a, a percentage of people that present with chest pain, though, right? And so uh, we basically sent her over and did a, and we knew from the coronary CT that she did not have vulnerable plaques in her LED. She just had a little piece of calcium. Those calcium plaques usually don't erode. They can, they have like 9% of a heart attacks are from erosion of a calcified plaque. But we thought that was very unlikely given the LED didn't even get to the apex. And so we said, just based on our previous knowledge of her coronary CTA, we said it's a taco tsubo. Took her to the cath lab, everything was the same. And uh, she didn't have any problems or abnormalities. And uh, coronary CTA, we're, uh, MRI, we're getting towards the end here. Coronary MRI revealed no evidence of late gadolinium enhancement. And so she had no scar, as we believe it's supposed to be. She's on an ACE beta blocker and her diuretic and doing fine. And her echo seven days later returned to normal. And so, so did she have, did she have vasospasm? She, well, we think she had taco tsubo because vasospasm wouldn't produce that either because you'd have to have several arteries going into arterial spasm. And, and I uh, have focal spasm. Well, she had focal spasm in the LED. That wouldn't produce that lesion because she, that wouldn't, it only goes down to about two-thirds of the interventricular sulcus and never gets to the apex. And so it's beyond the reach of a single vessel spasm. Mm. I would still put that as a possibility. Uh, so you could do, actually there have been studies uh, this guy has been doing at the time of talking to Subo Discovery is doing ACTH injection, acetylcholine and uh, trying to induce vasospasm uh, on several vessels or one vessel at the time of discovery of talking to Subo and has some data on that and so that's uh, that there is a proposition about that. Uh, of course, uh, also we know that the receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine are much more concentrated in the apex, the apical inferior wall, apical septum than anywhere else, and that's where the stress heart theory comes into being. She's under a lot of stress, but no dramatic stress like the death of a loved one or something like that. So we all know the relationship, uh, as shown by Darby, uh, basically in the New England Journal of Medicine article a couple of years ago, showing mean radiation dose and percent increase in rate of major coronary events. And we know that relationship exists. We also know studies in Hodgkin's and long-term risk of cardiac disease is increased. We know that bypass surgery has to be done or angioplasty frequently in these patients. And we're all looking for main left LED lesions when they show up. Uh, to see us, and we do have uh, some recommendations that have been outlined uh, for looking at different things that happen in terms of interest in the radiation to the neck because of dysautonomia, 
We have some people who can't even stand up because of that uh, occurring uh, 10 years later. We have uh, looking for risk factors, uh, you know, trying to assess patients more. And talking to SUBO also has a relationship to cancer patients, and we're not sure uh, uh, what that relationship really could be, but there are proposals about stress from initial diagnosis, complications of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy, all of which are not well outlined. We also know there are several drugs that have been shown coincidental with talking to SUBO syndrome and uh, the, the relationship not having been heavily explored. And uh, basically this lady uh, uh, um, in the literature, uh, basically a 66-year-old lady with breast cancer, right mastectomy, radiotherapy, chest pain, normal cardiac enzymes, and talking to SUBO. So we find, uh, we find that occurs. We also know that, uh, here's the Darby about it, uh, nowadays, radiation for the breast uh, being a very weak risk factor because of actually getting down to one and a half to one percent absolute risk uh, and that being compared to smoking, hypertension, diabetes, and a uh, confluence of risk factors being a very minor uh, risk factors then uh, because of that. And so basically conclusions are radiation therapy of the breast has been associated with increase in cardiac events especially uh, in postmodern days. The risk has decreased to less than 1% in modern trials. Location, 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 and the mid-LED and diagonal are the ones that are exposed mostly to the radiation. And current techniques of radiation planning have minimized whole heart and coronary dosing with CT-based 3D planning, which you saw, prone position, deep inspiration, breath hold, and proton therapy because of Bragg's point being much more specific uh, to the targeted area without radiation beyond that. And so uh, that's sort of uh, where we are, and those are our references. If anybody has any discussion, we would love to hear from them. Again, uh, some information being with advanced cardiac imaging, people with oncology clinics are more prone to uh, use the techniques that we have, so we're very interested in coronary CT on any patients that ladies over 50, men over 40 who are coming into our cardiology clinic because of for cardio oncology we want to know what the baseline is. We want to know what we're starting in and where we're going and so that's why we're doing that. And then the following patients uh, who are appropriate with uh, 3D imaging for ejection fraction and uh, with strain imaging either MRI or echo is very interesting, and uh, I'm not sure what uh, how that's going to play out. But the sucker study is being conducted by Dr. Morwick, multi center. We dropped out. We were part of it. We couldn't continue because our patients uh, really uh, are more of a concierge type uh, group of patients who didn't want to be enrolled in a study, unfortunately, and uh, they wanted uh, to get uh, some strain echoes, and uh, so they weren't willing to be in a placebo group. Uh, in terms of not looking at the strain echo information. So, any comments uh, from the group? No, those were, uh, those were really interesting images, especially the, the second patient. I really think, you know, that was uh, the CT clearly uh, was, was the money image on, in his story. And, you know, he's lucky to be alive. That's all I'll say. Yeah, and it's also the money image in the third patient because because of that CT, we knew that there was not an LED that hooked the apex, and so we said, talk it to Supo. Yeah, I think, you know, that case is still, uh, I would say, still uncertain. We had a patient just a few weeks ago that uh, presented with, you know, an EKG not dissimilar for, to that and was acutely ill, and... Uh, Cath was basically normal. She had a very minimal troponin elevation, and she actually had sudden death at the time of her original presentation. And she reported an episode of pretty typical chest pain like a year ago. She did not have any evaluation for it. She sort of wrote it out at home. And then this time when she had her episode of sudden death, it was preceded by pretty typical chest pain. And 
I think that the only thing that made sense in the whole picture was vasospasm, and so so I think that uh, I would still put that out there as a possibility. So certainly we've seen a lot of principal angina in the past. Usually it's smokers. Saw it frequently in women, and uh, we had sudden death patients uh, that we actually brought in and studied with sudden death. We were doing a, a funded research study of sudden death with Tampa Fire Rescue, and so we did have uh, people who had recognized basal spasm, positive ergonovine test, who uh, had uh, sudden death uh, and had the same kind of syndrome that you're talking about. And it's very common. Uh, and uh, I guess now you would explore that with acetylcholine uh, testing in the cath lab. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I would ever do that. I, I did it when I was a fellow and got scared out of my life, you know, just watching the vasospasm occur right in front of me. So I'm not uh, not one to do that type of prov provocative testing. But I think the if you don't have... Uh, an adequate explanation, then I would look for causes of basal spasm. So, in some people, that would be, you know, alcohol use, uh, some some drugs that promote basal spasm. Uh, of course, cocaine being one of them. But, uh, you know, so there's all that, and then you know, it would alter your therapy choice. So, in the usual patient that presents with an acute coronary syndrome and and has heart failure, you're going to use, you know, ACE and beta blocker, but in the case of somebody that you thought it was vasospasm, you might use something different, either nitrates or... Now, we have had patients with coronary emboli who basically, we've had, the, of course, the patient with mitral stenosis who gets a coronary embolus to the right coronary and gets uh, and it lysis, and uh, we lyse it, and they get a, they have basically an inferior wall MI that resolves quickly, and we have the Takotosubos that come in that basically we don't have an origin, we follow them, we finally have atrial fibrillation episodes with RVR uh, that were unbeknownst to anybody, and uh, then we find that they have a coagulopathy uh, with a high homocysteine level or some other uh, coagulopathy, and we conclude that their Takotosubo was really uh, an embolic episode that lysed, and so that needs to be considered as well. Yeah, well, I think that at least based on your MRI in your case, uh, you didn't see any evidence of true infarction. So, so I think that sort of, and somebody who has a thrombus that goes away, they they usually have a, a mark. They'll have a they'll have a area of infarction. Yeah, and all those observations that I made preceded our MRI era, so I can't tell you. So, any other comments from anybody in the group? Yeah, Art, I think that uh, you are blessed to have images of unbelievably great quality that don't exist at most other places. Yeah, I would say we're not we're not seeing those CTs. I can tell you that. Yeah, we've got Dr. Morales here with us, and uh, he uh, and Dr. Tajik. Uh, Dr. Morales is very much uh, up front and center uh, in our imaging. Uh, and I want to extend to him the compliment that Joe Carver gave of the uh, images that we have that uh, basically people from the University of Pennsylvania, people from uh, Vanderbilt University, and uh, there's no images to compare in, uh, in our local uh, practice. Uh, basically, we're the only advanced cardiac imaging practice in, uh, in private practice. And it's an unusual thing. We don't have interventionalists. We don't have other folks in the practice were just advanced cardiac imaging and trying to, uh, we have a core laboratory that receives images from other hospitals that we review and analyze. We also help people develop their technical skills. We're also working with 16 hospitals to develop better cardiac imaging. Uh, for what we say is that we've been, we've been riding a two-wheeled uh, motorcycle, like we hope it's a Ducati, but basically it's had uh, two wheels which have been Echo and uh, Nuke, and now we've got a four-wheel Ferrari, which is Echo, Nuke, CT, and MRI. And so we're very proud of our four-wheel Ferrari now. All right. <laughs> and are these are, are these images that you that that you can get done for 150 bucks? 
the uh, the price of the coronary CT is less than three hundred dollars out of pocket, and so uh, we get that done. We also have insurers that have confidence in us. We've had radiation benefit managers from NIA and from Med Solutions come to Tampa and uh, have dinner with me, come to my house, come over here and see our imaging center. And so we have distinguished ourselves as being unique in private practice in acquiring images that uh, cause a decreased amount of spending. If a cardiologist touches a patient, it's $7,000 to the system. We have $300 tests that are in test, and that's it. You don't have to go any further. That's saving money for sure. And so the MRI is about five or $600. And uh, we have uh, bargains for PET. We have a $500 bargain for PET for patients uh, for out-of-pocket. And so basically, we've been able to come up with those prices and, uh, and, and charge patients and maintain a viable uh, practice and a viable imaging center here. Super. That, uh, that's really great. So thank All you, everybody. Right. We uh, you. appreciate your attendance. We're looking for volunteers for the next uh, uh, 10 months uh, for our cardiac imaging uh, and for our, our cardio-oncology uh, conference uh, monthly. And so uh, please get in touch with Janelle to sign up because we want to see what everybody's doing and uh, want to interact with you. So we appreciate that. And uh, we appreciate uh, you'll be getting memos uh, to sign up. We just took this because nobody else uh, was interested in signing up. We'll continue if nobody wants to sign up, but you're going to get hard, tired of hearing from me. I'm tired of seeing the good images, for sure. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Dan. Bye, Joe. Yeah.